as soon as we do that. Admit all now. Have a great event. Okay, well, I will start. Hello, uh, my name is Jim Grant. Um, and uh, on behalf of the Loyola Sustainability Research Center and Loyola College for Diversity and Sustainability, welcome to our third and final day of our uh, kind of inspirational conference celebrating Indigenous expertise and sustainability. I first want to thank Fourth Space. Thank you for partnering with us yet again this year and making this conference uh, so successful. Um, if you've missed some of the events over the past three days, I encourage you to watch some of the recordings uh, that are on Fourth Space. Somebody will pop something in the chat where you can go see those. And I know I will go back to, to rewatch some of them. Um, in particular, I want to tell you about two. Nicholas Renault, uh, who gave the opening talk, has posted two films, uh, which you can see on the website. Um, one of them, Brave New River, you can watch until the 27th. Um, so if you have a chance, watch that. And let me tell you, I'm going to give a territorial acknowledgement shortly, but I thought I'd tell you about a, a really interesting panel we had earlier today. Three young members of, from Ganawage spoke about their experience at COP26, which is quite moving. So in particular, you might want to watch that one. So, okay, so before I introduce our, our first session, I'll begin with the territorial acknowledgement. Uh, many of us are joining this, this meeting today from in and around Montreal, which is also known as Jajoge. I acknowledge that Concordia University is located on unceded indigenous lands, the custodians of which are recognized as the Ginakahaga Nation. Uh, it, much, of our nation uh, much of our research and sustainability is about land and places, so I think it's particularly important to, to learn about uh, the places we do our research. If you'd like to do that, or if you're tuning in from somewhere other than Montreal, Rebecca will, will uh, put a nice tool into the chat where you can learn more about the land that's of interest to you. Well, this is our final event today with our second keynote speaker, which we're really delighted about. Um, I'm gonna pass things over to Carly Zeter in just a minute to introduce her. Uh, I'll say that uh, this, this uh, seminar is sponsored by the Department of Biology. So it's, it's appropriate that uh, Carly introduces her. She's a professor in the Department of Biology with an interest in urban ecology and the provision of ecosystem services. I think it's because Carly knows Andrea that maybe Andrea took time out of her busy schedule to come speak with us today. So over to you, Carly. All right, thanks, Jim. Uh, I'm, I'm coming to you with my mask on because I've got some of my lab here excited to watch Andrea's talk uh, on the big screen on our lab projector. And so Andrea is an indigenous fisheries scientist. Uh, she's a citizen of the Nisga Nation, as well as a new assistant professor at the University of British Columbia. Uh, but before that, Andrea was uh, much closer to where many of us are now. She did her master's degree in biology at McGill, as well as a PhD uh, at the University of uh, Carleton University, just up the road in Ottawa. Um, Andrea has lots of accolades I could add to her name. She's a National Geographic Explorer, a fellow of the Explorers Club, a winner of many awards. Um, but I'd really like to introduce Andrea as a, as a longtime friend and a colleague of mine. And so we, um, <laughs> thank you, Andrea. So we met almost 10 years ago now, actually, when we were doing our master's degrees together uh, at McGill and have been friends and colleagues um, ever since, kind of following each other's career paths. And what I personally really appreciate most about Andrea is her, her commitment to, to community and to relationships and to doing science that is inclusive and is, um, is kind, for lack of a better way, that brings people together and, and builds them up. And you know, as kind of young professors, we often have conversations of, you know, the challenges of being in this academic system. And I always leave those conversations very confident that with people like Dr. Reed, we are leaving behind a better academic system than the one that we perhaps inherited. Um, so with that, I am so glad to have Andrea here with us today. For those of you who attended the uh, Indigenous Youth panel earlier today, you heard a lot about the importance of, of weaving together Western and Indigenous worldviews in our science. And I think you'll get a great perspective on that from Andrea's talk. Uh, so take it away. So nice to have you here virtually with us. Thank you so much, Carly. And this definitely feels like a bit of a, 
a full circle moment in terms of having Carly open things up as my, you know, doing our masters alongside one another, but also to have Jim Grant, who was my master's external examiner, um, say a, a hello to start. So, so that's wonderful. Um, I'm just going to share my screen and could I just get a signal from someone that they can see that okay? It looks great. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Um, so yeah, my absolute pleasure to be here with you to share this talk on how Indigenous leadership is essential to conservation, drawing from examples from coastal British Columbia, um, where I'm currently joining you from. I'm now situated on the territories of the Hamasquiam, the Tsleil-Waututh, and the Skohomish, with many of you situated, as Jim noted, on the unceded lands of the Ghanagahaga Nation. I'm a citizen and member of the Niska Nation, as Carly shared, and that sits just on the, the border between British Columbia and Alaska, so just at the base of the Alaska Panhandle. So I'm a visitor where I currently am, but I'm also a proud partner of these nations on research initiatives that we've created together, seeking to understand and safeguard the health of water, of fish, and of communities who have long relied on and taken care of these beings and systems. I founded the Center for Indigenous Fisheries at the University of British Columbia in January of last year, and it's through my role as its principal investigator that I carry the immense honor and privilege of working with these nations and teaching and learning alongside students, many of which are working within their own home territories and for their own nations. We have initiated what is a first permanent center for creating, knowing, and sharing in the domain of indigenous fisheries science within a university context, but we will not be the last. We are working together to make great change within the university system and in the broader system of centralized and top-down fisheries management in this country. And we're strengthened by really being composed of a dynamic group of early career and senior researchers, of partner nations, um, of, an in, of an Indigenous Advisory Council that we're currently building, which will be made up of elders, fishers, and different kinds of knowers, as well as different kinds of members in residence, such as an artist in residency for those that we collaborate closely with, such as Klingit artist Rico Whirl, who created this logo for our center. And Rico's artist statement explains that this design depicts the way we observe the land and the land observes us back. It reminds us that the land relates back to us as we relate to it. And it depicts the cycles, the salmon egg and the arrival and departure of each new generation on that land. I share this with you here and now because who we are is researchers or practitioners or learners in the realm of sustainability or science matters greatly to what we do in our respective roles. No one is coming into this work unbiased and without values shaped by the social and political context that we exist within. I've talked about my location geographically and sociopolitically in relation to my identity as an indigenous woman, as a researcher and supervisor and professor within a university system. And all of these different parts of me make up who I am as a whole person. I can't separate them when it feels convenient to walk away from certain realities. I've talked about the honor and privilege that I carry being in my role in the center. And I wanna be clear here that I also carry a lot of privilege by virtue of where I work and what I do, what I have access to, what I look like. Pretending that this has no bearing on my work does no favors to those young indigenous scientists coming up behind me because they'll face barriers I haven't had to because they don't blend in in the way that I can. So I do this with them close in mind and in, in heart so that the path can be eased for them to really succeed, for them to have the opportunity to join in learning opportunities and participate in education that has been built with them and their well-being in mind. I too often have colleagues say that they didn't think that there would be Indigenous students in their classroom, so didn't anticipate the unintentional harms that they've caused. But harm is harm, and thinking about our own positionality and responsibilities to UNDRIP, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, to the TRC, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, to MMIWG, Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls, these are first steps 
towards shifting from that space of unintentional harm and into intentional well-being for all. So what I'm sharing with you over this next half hour or so, I'll try to keep it brief. I know we're a little behind schedule and it's a Friday afternoon, so I don't want to keep you here too long. But it comes from a, a chapter that I'm co-authoring with my colleague and friend, Dr. Natalie Ban at the University of Victoria. And it's our shared responsibility to healthy water, healthy fish, healthy people that brought us together and that bring us into this work. Our invited chapter on this topic that I'm here to talk about today will be part of a forthcoming open access nonprofit digital textbook um, with open book publishers entitled Navigating Our Way to Solutions in Marine Conservation, edited by Dr. Larry Crowder at Stanford. So while not available to the public yet, it will be within the year. I also want to acknowledge up front that the visuals contained in this chapter and talk are ones that I conceptualized, but due to a severe lack of artistic talent on my behalf, we commissioned our colleague Nicole Marie Burton to help bring them to life. So all illustrations that you'll see throughout this are attributable to her brilliant work, and I'd encourage you to go check out some of her wonderful graphic stories and kids books like Cole Mountain and The Boy Who Walked Backwards. We begin our chapter in much the same way I've started us off today, thinking about positionality, territory, responsibilities, gratitude. And we begin with this caution that I share here, given the uniqueness of Indigenous cultures in BC, in Canada, and around the world, the commonalities and distinctions drawn here will not necessarily be relevant or reflective of the realities of all Indigenous nations. There's no one indigenous perspective or way of being or knowing, which is why we purposefully pluralize cultures, knowledges, peoples, nations, perspectives, understandings, the list goes on and on. There's not any one of these, just a great many. And we do this work with the hope that we can work together towards building space for multiple ways of knowing, as Carly alluded to, in university institutions and in a field, conservation, that have long histories of Indigenous exclusion and injustice that fundamentally need to be recognized and redressed. These, these have disempowered and dispossessed Indigenous peoples across these lands and waters where we each are, and the impacts will be long felt. The need for and value of Indigenous-led conservation is being increasingly recognized by the academic community and the public. And this is apparent in Canada and around the world where policymakers and various actors in dominant society have failed to control human activities, driving climate change and habitat loss, while Indigenous lands and waters in a great many cases have been successfully taken care of over millennia. While Indigenous peoples make up roughly 6% of the global population, Indigenous peoples manage or have tenure rights over at least 38 million square kilometers in 87 countries, representing over a quarter of the world's land surface and intersecting about 40% of all terrestrial protected areas and what the authors of that particular study describe as ecologically intact landscapes. While how much control Indigenous peoples have over these areas is a giant and unanswered question. The fact remains that working in the realm of conservation and sustainability, working with land and water to protect land and water and their inhabitants, including ourselves, this requires working with the people who have rights and responsibilities tied up in all of these lands and waters. In Australia, Brazil, and Canada, vertebrate biodiversity in Indigenous territories, which is shown here on the far left of each panel in red, that has been shown to equal or surpass that found within formally protected areas, the, the green bar in the middle of each panel shown here. Far from this colonial idea of separating people from nature in order to preserve nature, of fences and fines, and the concept of the pristine primitive or untouched wilderness free from human influence, indigenous approaches to conservation regularly place people as part of the system, recognizing that abundant clams, for example, on the coast of British Columbia are no accident and have in fact been cultivated, gardened and kept by people through time, taken care of through relationships that involve 
ethics based on respect, reciprocity, and responsibility. And this is a figure that I'll come back to a few times throughout this talk. Supporting Indigenous-led conservation can help us meet our responsibilities to UNDRIP and the TRC, as well as agreements that have been reached to govern Crown Indigenous relations like the Peace and Friendship Treaties. In 2019, British Columbia became the first province in Canada to create legislation setting out a process to align provincial law with UNDRIP, creating potential to transform what has historically been a relationship of tension and conflict to one possibly characterized by collaboration, respect, and real partnership, though recent events would not signal these changes are underway. But at this current time of political and, and racial awakening alongside movements like Black Lives Matter and Land Back, there's perhaps greater social and institutional will to cultivate a more socially justice uh, a more socially just reality for all people, ultimately creating space for Indigenous societies, values, knowledge systems to govern, as they once did, lands and waters within traditional territories. Over the last two decades, there's been a reckoning in conservation science that social sciences are vital to ensuring the uptake and efficacy of conservation measures, and that conservation science needs to embrace social ecological systems thinking to meet the needs of both the environment and society at large. Effectively, that social science methodologies and insights are essential to achieving successful conservation and that the effects of conservation on people matter. We believe that conservation science is on the cusp of another reckoning, that social ecological approaches and methodologies alone are insufficient and that embracing multiple ways of knowing, especially indigenous ways of knowing is essential if humanity is to, to protect biodiversity and respect and uplift human rights. However, recognizing the value of indigenous knowledges in conservation, it isn't new, but many conservation case studies of the past have focused on these really utilitarian aspects of indigenous knowledge systems by considering traditional ecological knowledge, TEK, as this source of data to be incorporated into Western science framings of conservation, or by appropriating aspects of indigenous cultures into conservation, such as taboos. These kinds of approaches contribute to disempowering indigenous peoples by extracting knowledge for external purposes and continues truly colonial legacies. Instead, what we need is conservation science that supports, uplifts, and respects indigenous rights, stewardship and knowledges and thereby expands conservation approaches beyond our current Western science visions. Along with the reckoning of conservation science to recognize multiple ways of knowing comes a need to understand what indigenous science is. While indigenous science was only defined as a term in the literature in recent decades, its existence is longstanding and it is generally accepted now as the scientific knowledge of all peoples who as participants in culture are affected by the worldview and interests of their home community. According to the Worldwide Indigenous Science Network, um, Indigenous science is a way of perceiving the world that is holistic, participatory, and in balance with the Earth's life support systems. In many cases, across distinct Indigenous cultures, Indigenous science is holistic and inherently transdisciplinary. TEK can be one facet of it as a larger whole, and it is contained within a much larger body of philosophies and understandings. Indigenous knowledge and whole knowledge systems that are carried by languages and stories through time, through ceremonies and practices that are guided and protected by law, a common feature is that so-called nature, which is not viewed in isolation or as separable from people, is understood as being alive, intelligent, possessing inherent rights to which humans bear a tremendous responsibility. This is reflected as one example in the legal rights of personhood that were bestowed in 2017 on the Wanganui River in Aotearoa, New Zealand to align with Maori rights and cosmology. 
the non-human or what many term the more than human are positioned as relatives or gifts, depending on the context and culture, rather than commodities or machinery subject to human control. Indigenous science therefore stems from a vastly differing foundation than Western science, culminating in super distinct approaches to understanding, interacting with and stewarding the world around us. Indigenous stewardship practices are often steeped in highly reciprocal relationships, where it is not solely humans that need fish and land as examples, but that fish and land also need people as more than harvesters or users, but as caretakers and stewards. Humans are not strictly perceived as a destructive or consumptive force, but as beings with constructive or productive powers. For indigenous peoples in coastal British Columbia, determining who has access um, as well as responsibility to a specific place and what shape that responsibility takes was and is linked to the clan system and specific house groups where chiefs and matriarchs often um, in the context of house feasts or potlatches, which were banned in Canada from 1885 to 1951 as part of national cultural assimilation processes. And this potlatching system created community accountability as well as serving as a kind of monitoring device where the sustainability of harvest and stewardship practices was subject to repeated assessments and discussion by those that potlatch together. What the literature calls customary tenure systems or locally managed marine areas are one common expression of indigenous led marine conservation that still form the basis of contemporary ocean management today in various parts of the world. But in regions where colonial forces actively undermine indigenous peoples, which are many, are vast, indigenous governance revitalization efforts are underway, but recognition by colonial governments is desperately slow. Our aim in this chapter in addition to framing that context was to demonstrate from our lived and ongoing experiences working in partnership with First Nations in coastal BC, what marine and freshwater indigenous led conservation can look like and lead to. Our focuses were on the Kitasu Hehe Nation um, on the BC central coast in the community of Klemtu as well as my own nation, the Niska in Northern BC composed of four communities, Gingol, Lakals up, get one silk and get like Damex, um, which is just across from, from Haida Gwaii, from the northern coast of Haida Gwaii. So I'm going to begin by walking us through the Kitasu Hehe case study, followed by the Niska, emphasizing that what I'm about to share um, from outside of my nation's context derives strictly from Natalie's collaborative research and relationships there spanning many years, not my own knowledge or experience, and, and vice versa. So like many nations, Kitasu Hehe marine governance um, flows from underlying principles of Kitasu Hehe law that guides all actions, respect, reciprocity, and interconnectedness um, with ties to, to knowledge transfer across generations. Everything from people to plants to animals to places have the right to be respected in all forms, including physically and verbally. People have a responsibility to, to show gratitude and maintain reciprocity in relationship with the land, sea, environment, and other people. And this responsibility is commonly shown through territorial access and gift giving. Exchanges can be between people and animals and supernatural beings. People base decisions based on learning from experience, including the experiences of past generations and exchanging intergenerational knowledge, especially through story, is the main method to, to pass down these past experiences. And thus, language revitalization is so very important. Storytelling often occurs on the land and water while harvesting and processing foods, allowing experiential learning to take place. Adaptive management is a scientific principle that ties in with the concept of listening to your elders. And indeed, it is the responsibility and it's the practice of community members, and especially elders, to teach younger generations their knowledge. 
the natural environment and its species, including humans, are all connected. And this, this oneness means that one small change can have really profound impacts, can affect everything else. And therefore, everyone has a responsibility to ensure intergenerational and interspecies equity by using these species, these non-human relatives or gifts as foods sus sustainably. Kitasu Heihei Marine Governance implements these underlying principles through societal structures and practices. And the ocean is this key place where knowledge gets passed between generations, where teachings are performed. However, because oral tradition is not documented in a way that Western science acknowledges, it can be super challenging to recognize or cite this knowledge within the Western science paradigm. Historically, as well as today, Kitasu Heihei hereditary chiefs are stewards for the land and ocean territory held under their chief name to ensure their areas remain plentiful and healthy. Historically, families and lineages dispersed to seasonal spring and summer camps to, to use species as food or what others might call resources to which their lineage have rights and to which individual families have rights. Everyone using these more than human beings as food has an obligation to steward these areas. Historically, the responsibility really rested on the hereditary chiefs to ensure conservation of species by making decisions around harvesting. For example, by observing how many salmon are returning to a given stream, including telling families when fish can be harvested without overfishing. Conservation was also practiced through the right to exclude people and regulate access to the territory, both in the short term to allow the recovery of species and in the long term through agreements with neighboring nations. Although inevitably impacted by colonization, aspects of these practices and responsibilities continue to this day. Ongoing use of species as food through time was and continues to be a way of maintaining and displaying rights to resource claims. In other words, harvesting throughout the territory is a way to take care of places and enables stewardship actions through ongoing observations carried out by fishing. And fishing as care sounds transformative in some respects, but it has maybe existed as long as people have. Selective harvesting is paramount within these practices and examples include harvesting species that are abundant, selecting for specific characteristics and sizes, using fish traps and weirs that allow us to harvest uh, selectively or returning females or smaller individuals back to the water. Kitasu Heihei hereditary chiefs continue to use their long-standing authority to stand against non-Kitasu Heihei decisions being imposed on them. For example, in the 2010s, the Kitasu Heihei created their own management plan for herring, and that was completely distinct from the federal government's plan. And Kitasu Heihei members protested in an important bay in their territory, Kitasu Bay, against the commercial herring row fishery, reacting to concerns about declines in herring populations and unsustainable contemporary fisheries management. And after many years of protests, this has led to co-management of herring in their territory. And similarly, when Fisheries and Oceans Canada, formerly the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, DFO, when they disclosed new fishing regulations in Kitasu Bay for community members, the chiefs told the fisheries officers that they did not accept them and they went out to protest. Hereditary chiefs have the right, as well as the obligation to stand up and provide voice for people, plants, animals, place. And through this act of self-determination, hereditary chiefs and community members practice their authority uh, in regards to harvesting decisions and making some considerable wins along the way, even though the Canadian government does not yet fully recognize their authority. The other example of historic and contemporary Indigenous coastal fisheries stewardship that we discuss in this chapter involves that of the Niska Nation and the Nass Salmon Fishery in Northern BC. Here, the Nass River, the beautiful Nass River Lisms, as it's also known, 
sits at the very base of the Alaska Panhandle, as I said, where it flows from its headwaters, Nass Lake, for roughly 380 kilometers into the mouth of the Nass, which is what we're looking at currently, and then out into the Portland Inlet and into the Pacific Ocean. It has a drainage area of over 20,000 square kilometers, um, and the Nass, 20,000 kilometers, and the Nass River is BC's uh, third largest salmon producer, supporting all five species of, of anadromous BC salmon. And salmon are this key link between marine and coastal systems and epitomize how connected these systems are. Unlike the realities of Western governance in many indigenous worldviews and indeed that of the Niska, the land, fresh water and the sea, they're not seen as completely distinct entities but rather as interconnected and interdependent parts of a continuum. Conservation of coastal species such as salmon that provide a crucial link between systems is essential for healthy animals, plants, people, place, places. Through Ayuk Niska, Niska law, and Adawak, Niska oral histories, legends, customs, the Niska way of life has been maintained for centuries before European contact and to this day. This image in the background is an elder who's dear to me, Larry Derrick, and he's demonstrating and wearing this beautiful Chilkat blanket that uh, is designed to, to model the one that, that his father carried. And you can see a picture on the back wall where his father is wearing the, the, same, the same design, just showing that kind of like continuity through time. Niska cosmology centers on harmony and balance between people and all of the other elements of the environment in which Niska live. Balance has been built into Niska life to provide for the well being of whole families. The Niska way is said to me to be one of sharing within and among families and of being closely related to the land. And as examples of this balance and in line with reciprocal salmon people relationships, Niska fishing ethics often involve not playing with food, so avoiding catch and release fishing keeping what you catch using selective fishing methodologies. So there's no need for bycatch reduction strategies, only taking what you need and not more and sharing what you have with family. This system has provided for the people of the Nass River, the Niska, as well as neighboring nations for millennia. And the English name Nass, it likely comes from the Klingit language for their word, meaning intestines, or guts in reference to the river's huge food capacity in its fish. And the Nass River has served as a veritable food basket for many peoples and organisms pre-colonization and it continues to do so today where it underpins a large commercial fishery and remains the lifeblood of Niska culture and commerce. In the year 2000, a landmark agreement between the governments of the Niska, British Columbia and Canada came into effect, creating BC's first modern day treaty, one of only four ratified treaties out of more than 200 First Nations in the province, which involves a specific right to fish for salmon, a whole chapter on salmon in fact. And the treaty sets out the Niska right to self-government represented by the Niska Lisms government. The, the river Lisms is, is in our name. And this gives us authority to, to manage lands and species. And through a joint fisheries management committee, the Niskalisms government, British Columbia and Canada now co-manage the Nass salmon fishery through a renowned fishery science program that has been used for Nass salmon assessment and management for over three decades. This program uses this technology called fish wheels as well as other technologies on the Nass River to monitor, mark and collect data from fish swimming upstream, facilitating stock assessment on a variety of species throughout the watershed. And this management approach and plan is guided by Niska knowledge and priorities. It hinges on deep respect for salmon and recognition that salmon and people are interreliant. Ayuk, Niska, and Adawak detail Niska responsibilities to salmon and what living in a, in a good way in the Nass River entails. The methods used to monitor salmon populations are therefore positioned to minimize stress and harm to fish, and they endeavor to bring together 
the best tools available to improve our collective understanding of salmon status and fate. This system has been described as an ingenious fish counting system in the Nass River that combines ancient Niska fish wheel technology with modern statistical methods of data analysis. And fish wheels are truly, truly ancient. They've been modernized today and are made out of aluminum and other new materials, um, but they date back to many parts of the world and have been used in Rome, Japan, throughout various waterways around the world because they, they leverage the strength of a system and are just passively driven by the river current and enable this, this really important way to harvest or to monitor fish. That indigenous conservation continues as shown in these examples is evidence of the strength of indigenous peoples and worldviews in the face of historical colonial atrocities, including genocide. And I just wanna share a, a trigger warning here because what I'm about to say might be difficult for some to hear. So please do step away for, for a minute if you need. So while these examples can and should be celebrated, it is undeniable that past and ongoing colonization of coastal regions has resulted in rapid and drastic changes in indigenous management practices, including within Niska and Kitasuhehe territories, because they were criminalized, dispossessed, and or restricted out of existence. Indigenous peoples were forcibly relocated and declines of many species due to commercialization contributed to changed access to fish and a reduced ability to exercise self-determination and self-determined management practices. In Canada, the Indian Act enacted in 1876 and its associated policies prohibited indigenous cultural practices such as potlatches, banning indigenous selective fishing methods such as fish traps and weirs, it confined indigenous peoples onto reserves and forcibly removed children from their families, cultures and languages by sending them to residential schools. These past and ongoing policies severely diminished the well-being of entire nations disrupting indigenous knowledges and management practices and conservation. But thankfully there's a but, indigenous peoples have created many strategies to continue traditions and keep practicing culture despite genocidal policies. For example, an important celebration for the Kitasu Hehe, like many coastal nations, is the return of salmon each year. When potlatches were banned, Kitasu Hehe still celebrated this important event, but concealed it under the Salmon Queen and later the May Queen celebrations, ostensibly celebrating the Queen of England. And a pole was erected next to the May Queen stand in the center of the community with a salmon on top. People risked being arrested to continue this important celebration. And potlatches across many, nat across many nations were not extinguished, but instead driven underground and the languages, bodies of practice, while they were purposefully diminished by oppressors, they have not disappeared. And in many cases, they are just waiting to be reawakened through indigenous uh, revitalization, resurgence, the reassertion of indigenous rights to transform conservation science into a science and practice that embraces multiple ways of knowing. Conservation scientists and sustainability practitioners must support the original caretakers of lands, waters, and seas. This is not a question of allowing indigenous peoples to manage, steward, and govern their territories, which is a paternalistic attitude that has characterized much of the related policy and practice to date. But rather, this is a matter of creating space and stepping aside so indigenous leaders can lead. I can point to many resources, guides, and points of entry on how to do this, and I'm happy to speak more to these in the Q&A, but instead of prescribing steps that may or may not lead us to these ends that we all need, I'd like to leave you instead with a beautiful poem by Erica Violet Lee called Bones. The bones too, eat the bones too, eat the leaves of strawberries. Do not bite the fruit off and throw the rest away as if the plant grew itself with the intention of being easier for human hands. Soft salmon vertebrae melting into my jaw like warm chalk and taking bitter green with the sweet red shifts my perception of creation entirely. This 
is a lesson in scarcity, abundance, and reclaiming relational nourishment from what civilization calls trash. Erica's words help us think about the gifts of salmon and all beings, but instead of treating an act like eating the bones, like an act of self-sacrifice or inconvenience or seeing sustainability strictly through this lens of scarcity where all we need to do is eat less, do less, be less. A poem like this, I think it invites us into celebrating abundance, reclaiming traditions that allow us to be in relationship fully with these more than human beings. As well summarized by Jessica Hutchins, a Pailuku woman in Western Australia, she said that in Lee's poem, Eating the Bones, Refusing Waste, it isn't a practice of sacrifice or the product of mere survival. It is a unique and nourishing pleasure that is born out of living in the habit of abundance. That is of valuing the bountiful world around us, which we are embedded in and interconnected with. While scarcity scares us into believing that we have to grab whatever we can, a sense of abundance comes from knowing that the cycle will continue because it is cared for. So with that, I'll say toyaksinism. Thank you all for your time and care on this late Friday afternoon. Um, and I hope that we have some time to, to talk and to connect or totally understand if people need to peel off for their weekends. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much, Andrea, for um, a really incredible and moving and beautifully illustrated talk. I'm sure we all appreciated uh, seeing seeing all of those illustrations to accompany your words. Um, I am going to, unless unless Jim or Rebecca or someone jumps in to stop me, I think I am supposed to be stewarding our, our Q&A period here. And so if you have, thank you, Michael, for turning the lights back on. If you have uh, questions for Andrea or comments to share, you can put your questions um, into the chat. You can raise your little Zoom hand. You can uh, turn your, your video back on and raise a real hand at me, uh, whatever you know is within your, your capacity to, to get our attention feel free and I will will relay those questions on to to Andrea um, and you're seeing some little you you should have seen some clapping emojis and some some thank yous coming in in the, the chat as well from those of us who are watching. I just want to share that I would encourage those that are comfortable. I understand we're being recorded, so totally understandable if you're not. But if you're comfortable, please do turn on your video. When we're here talking about relational work, it is so wonderful to like see who we're talking to and you know entering into this relational space with. Come join me. I can move over and uh, make some some room for the the others that are in the room with me here. Um, all right, great. So if we have, if we have questions for questions or comments for Andrea, Jim, maybe we'll uh, Jim will start us off here with a question while others have a chance to to collect their thoughts. Uh, Andrea, that was uh, that was inspirational. Thank you for that. Uh, uh, you know, you you've been trained in both worlds. Do you see? treaties as in bc as the way forward for sustainable management um uh yeah just what's your bigger view of that yeah, yeah it's a big question an important one jim i think treaties that exist like the peace and friendship treaties for for eastern canada they lay out you know these baseline mutual expectations for what indigenous settler relations look like, and they've been largely neglected. There are so many instances where treaties are, are overlooked and, and what is laid out within them doesn't hold water. So they can be extremely problematic, but they do provide us with documents to come back to. And I'm, I'm frequently reminded by um, Mi'kmaq elder, Dr. Albert Marshall, who I have the privilege of, of learning from that as indigenous peoples in this country, we hold a unique responsibility and ability to take the crown to court, unlike many other citizens in, in Canada. And with that, we have this ability to, 
to enact change that can be really profound. And if we just look at some of the constitutional um, decisions, the Sparrow decision, the Marshall decision, they have really shifted the fisheries landscape in this country. And I think treaties give us some kind of leverage to, to work with and on, but it really depends on how well they are respected. In British Columbia, the context is so complex because colonization was more well, was a great deal more recent than in other regions of Canada. And few nations here, as I noted, have entered into treaty. So all treaties here are, are very modern day and and quite contentious, but they are a means of, of establishing self-governance and establishing self-reliance. Um, so it's it's an interesting and big subject and definitely evolving. Great, thanks for that. So respecting existing treaties would be a good start. Thank you. All right, looks like we have a, a question from Nick. You wanna go ahead and unmute yourself there. Sure. Thank, first, thank you, Andrea, for a very enlightening presentation. I really enjoyed it. And I was wondering, um, what do you see that are um, the next the next questions to answer or uh, the next steps to take to make progress in this um, situation? I think it depends on you know, who you are and what hat you wear. I think that the, the next steps vary greatly by that context. And those resources I alluded to, I can pop them in the chat. I find that, oh, did I copy the right ones? Yes, I did, okay. Um, there are four links there, but they look like they've smashed into one. Um, they do a really wonderful job because Predominantly, they ask a lot of really good questions to help individuals navigate this for themselves. And I find that a really useful orientation. Um, I really meant what I said at the end in terms of, you know, getting out of the way to let Indigenous leaders lead. There are so many blockages to, to that being the case and to nations in this country having sovereignty over their own lands and waters. And so I think it's whatever we can do to, to enable that, to support that, whether that's making those interests known to, to politicians or on smaller scales. There's so much change to make within even our university context, like advocating for change in your like localized space in which you work can be life-changing for other students and individuals moving through those areas. Thank you very much. No problem. I happy to elaborate more if you have a follow up. All right, Bella, go ahead and ask a question here. Uh, yeah, thanks, Andrea. Andrea, this is really a really really excellent talk. Um, I work with Carly, and I I work in urban systems, and and maybe this is out of your expertise, and and maybe this isn't a fair question, and <laughs> I. I I spend a lot of time thinking about how to support like indigenous led movements and, and conservation in, in cities where it feels like colonization is kind of at its peak um, in the way that like, it, it feels like the, the area where people have been forced off the land kind of the most. And so maybe I was wondering if you have like resources or or kind of thoughts on like how you can do this in a, in a more urban context, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's an interesting way to position it. I would agree that like, you know, erasure can be a lot stronger within an urban context, but I would note that even in what we would consider to be the most like quote unquote remote reaches of this country, some communities have been located like thousands of kilometers from where they once were. And we really see that south of the border in the United States, like the Trail of Tears, moved people from the territories they were connected to into whole new spaces and, and moving across what are now state lines. Um, but I, I would say it's just really about engaging with the nations 
that are there. They are present, um, I guess, as one example in, in my own context, working in Vancouver. Um, our first two master's students in the Center for Indigenous Fisheries are partnering with an organization called the First Nations Fisheries Legacy Fund, which is composed of six First Nations in the city. And we're working together. They came to us. They brought us a project that they really wanted to see built. And this is um, kind of taking a page out of the, the Maori Cultural Index book and contextualizing it for here, for the Lower Fraser, for these nations. And so this is creating a biocultural tool to look at the health of waterways, not only through our typical biological toolbox of measuring oxygen and flow and, and these various parameters, but thinking about like, well, if the system's healthy, but nobody can access it and use it for food or use it for ceremony or use it for transport, then what, what does health mean? And so we're working together on a question that they brought to us. We're working with them to, to build the tool. And we've had community workshop series throughout this process so that we're iter iteratively building this together and making sure that it's, that it's relevant, that it's pertinent. And I guess that kind of approach that spans whether we're, we're talking urban context or not, but I guess I'm just trying to emphasize that there are ways of, of connecting, but the biggest and most important thing in these spaces is that question of agency. The fact that nations are bringing forward these interests and questions and we're not coming to them with this big agenda that we're trying to prescribe and get our own needs fulfilled in terms of thesis or publications or whatever it might be, like putting those seriously in on the back burner, like being, being transparent about the reality that those are there and requirements for these students to succeed, but that those at the end of the day are not the reasons the students are doing this work. They are doing this work because they're really committed to doing this work in this way. Does that, does that help, Isabella? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, thank you for sharing and thank you for your talk. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. And one of the links, I think the first one, is the, the Indigenous Ally Toolkit, um, which I imagine you might have encountered before, but it's got, I mean, it's coming from the Montreal context. And so it might have some more like locally relevant thoughts. Okay, we have a hand up from Ling Shan, and then I think I've got some questions behind me. So I'm gonna cede my space here to them after that. Ling Shan, go ahead. We can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Oh, Andrea, thank you for your presentation. I think it's great and it's very meaningful. Uh, I'm also a student in Paris now. Um, well, I have a little question, but I don't know whether you have talked about it because I've been late for a few minutes uh, for this presentation. Well, I'm just a little bit curious about the, the difference between the concept of the conservation and sustainability, because uh, I don't know whether uh, the conservation works more for like the indigenous population, uh, the indigenous natural source, something like that, uh, and sustainability maybe for a broader population. Because, you know, for, for my country, I think we are all, most of us are the indigenous people. So I'm not sure if the conservation science works for, for us. Thanks for your question. I think, I mean, I think it's indicative of a, a broader important theme in this space, which is as in all spaces, but defining our terms and knowing what it is that we're talking about. But so many of these terms have the potential to, to really have like a kind of a being disjointed from the worldviews of those that we're working with. So we have to think really carefully, like management is a word that does not resonate in all contexts, but some nations really do like to use it. So I would say that it, you know, it has to be a working conversation for what reflects their own language and what feels like the most appropriate translation or embodiment of, of 
I guess, terms and practices that they, that they do ascribe to. Um, and the same goes for resource for so many people, even research. Research can be such a scary word for communities that have been really harmed by past research. And so we have to use our words because they carry power cautiously and conscientiously. Um, for sustainability specifically, like it's gonna vary again by like nation to nation context. But if we were to look at say the, the Mi'kmaq nation, they have a concept called Nedigalimk, which I'm not pronouncing perfectly, but that's as good as I'm gonna get it not being Mi'kmaq myself. Um, and that really is, that is sustainability, but it's framed in such a beautiful way where it's about maintaining the ecological and economic well-being and integrity of the present without compromising it for future generations. And for many indigenous cultures in this country, not all, but many do have um, notions around seven generations. And that's not looking ahead into the future seven generations or back seven generations. It's often with us in the middle and looking ahead three and back three. And these are hypothetically, these are people that you might meet in your lifetime, right? And so they're people that were directly connected to and that might be part of knowledge transmission and, and points of connection. So for me, sustainability, I, I see that word having actually greater resonance for many nations in this country, but context super matters. So I, I know I'm a broken record here. Conservation is loaded. And because of the histories of like forced removals from so many of our national parks where people's, people were just pushed outside those boundaries, that can be a really rough pill to swallow. So it, it kind of, it depends, but that's, that word can be more troubling. Thank you. You're getting a, a thumbs up on your pronunciation from, from Brian Isaac in the chat who has uh, been really instrumental in, in helping Rebecca run this conference and then doing a lot behind the scenes. Um, so thank you, Brian, for, for chiming in there. So I'm, I'm gonna bring, he doesn't have a name on the chat. So this yeah. is Eric Peterson, who's another biology professor. Um, and I promise not in my lab, just physically in my lab space. So we're not taking over the whole conversation. <laughs> Although Andrea and I did overlap at McGill, so it's good to see you again. But so, yeah, I love the talk, it's really fascinating. Um, in terms of, so you talked a lot about sort of the, the contextuality, you know, the, the context of local fisheries and, and, you know, the communities having this built-in knowledge about how to deal with and how to manage and how to, you know, maybe manage not the right, how to live with these fisheries and how to build them into their lives. So, but as we're seeing, you know, ongoing climate changes, we're seeing new gears or new sort of shifts, even for me, like from, um, sustained, uh, um, food based fisheries to commercial fisheries. Is there a role for sort of the, the non indigenous fisheries community in which we can help or, or even like aid in trying to develop these, these new opportunities? And, or is there a, is this something we should just, you know, basically still stay back out of and, and try to say like, you can, you know, to let people try and figure out how to do, to manage these these new resources or these new opportunities sort of on their own. By by new opportunities, do, sorry, do you mean like as species shift with climate change and changes occur in our in our systems? Well, so so I work on northern shrimp, and I, I you know collaborated with a few um, communities, and I've, I've talked to people in Nunavut who are who are working in fisheries there, and like you know shrimp is a deep water species that was basically not harvestable prior to industrial fishing, like. You know, there would have been small scale near shore fishing, but it, it was most of the stock was not reachable. So I guess I struggle with trying to figure out, okay, like how do we, we know a lot about the biology in, in other areas and, and how we would success, uh, how we might have succeeded or failed at managing in other places. But I guess what I struggle with is, is how much can we, I guess, provide knowledge, like provide knowledge transfers that, or is there even like a, a way to, integrate what we've learned in other areas with trying to help with uh, trying to work with the community to improve management of these new fisheries these, these fisheries that are they might not have yet like the the traditional knowledge around besides mm -hmm. like what we know about the, the the whole ecosystem yeah yeah it's an interesting context as these things 
change. And we see that with, with salmon as well, shifting into, in the, into the Arctic. And I'm so used to this frame of reference where salmon are revered. <laughs> and then they're coming into these systems as new species where there, there isn't that history there. Um, I would say that it's, it's so similar to, you know, receiving help on an individual level, like help is wonderful so long as it's wanted and not everybody wants or needs it. And so I think like if, if the agency is, is there and um, there's what you are offering is sought after and is being, you know, done responsively to their interests and needs. And I think absolutely there's always a place for, collaborative work in these spaces. I mean, fisheries are, are so complex. And if we manage them with only one group in mind, we are never going to manage them well. And I think that's, that's been a common problem, right? We, for DFO, they are an agency that is tasked with conservation and economic opportunity all at once. And that is a, a profound paradox that has often put them put their own policies at odds with one another. I, I really think that we need to understand what indigenous fishing rights are and allow that to um, enable agency on the part of nations. For, for the context of salmon on the West Coast, it is such a struggle because there is a, a very clearly prescribed um, order of access and priority. And after conservation, it is indigenous food systems followed by recreational and commercial opportunities. But the way the salmon come home every year is they hit commercial and rec opportunities often first and indigenous fisheries almost last and last but not least is conservation in terms of them reaching their spawning grounds and bringing forward the next generation. So the way that they get tackled, the way that they get managed is the inverse of how we would want to be operating based on what we've prescribed in the constitution and, and thinking about how we do things well in an ecological standpoint. Um, so yeah, rich and complex, but definitely I think that's kind of the notion of two-eyed seeing, right? Is like coming together, bringing everyone to the decision-making table together. And the biggest part is that everyone has valid knowledge and, and, and skills and practices and methodologies to bring to that. And they shouldn't be kind of subsumed within the other in order to be rendered valid. And that really is the history of the use of traditional knowledge in the fisheries context in this country and many others. All right. Well, thank you all for you know, wonderful questions. And thank you, Andrea, for, for staying. We've kept you a little bit over time that we, uh, we told you we'd keep you as well. And so I think at this point, maybe another, uh, another virtual round of applause if you want to you know, click your little emoji or clap into, your, uh, clap into your screens here. And I am going to pass things back over to Jim, who's going to, to wrap things up and give some, uh, some very, um, very do thank yous to the many people involved in our conference. Thanks, Carly. Well, first, thank you, Andrea, for your, your passion and insight. Uh, what, a, what an appropriate way to wrap up our conference and continue our, our education and celebration of Indigenous approaches uh, to sustainability. So thank you very much for that. And thank you, Carly, for being the link that probably got Carly or got Andrea to come squeeze us into her busy schedule. Um, Yes, I I'll, I'll quickly thank some people and uh, Rebecca may want to jump in at the end, I'm not sure, but uh, first to fourth space, uh, what great allies, Anna and Doug, for supporting our conference year after year. It's been marvelous. Uh, I want to thank all the speakers um, uh, over the last uh, three, three days. In particular, I want to thank those who organized the panels and brought this Indigenous knowledge to us. Um, and I'll, I'll briefly name the Jean Jean-Bierre Siwi, Jen Gabi, Sandy Lamel, Dylan Fraser, Nicholas Renault, Monica Morenin, Jason Enns, Nat Natasha Blanchett Cohen, Alicia Barra LeMay, and Carly. Thanks, Carly. Um, uh, finally, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Rebecca Titler. This conference wouldn't happen without you, and to her able uh, assistant, Brian Isaac, for uh, making this all happen. So, um, with that, I guess remind uh, everyone you can re I know I'm going to rewatch Andrea's uh, talk, uh, get those references. Uh, there's so many great 
uh, nuggets of information. And, and so watch those recordings and particularly watch Nicholas Renault's film if you get a chance before March 27th. It's quite wonderful. The, the, the name is called Great River, I believe. Maybe, no, Andrew, uh, Rebecca will Brave tell me. Brave New River. Brave New River. And so it's I a full length documentary. We have access until the 27th. So, oh, and Nicola, oh, hi, Nicholas. Here. Hi, Nicholas. <laughs> It's, and it's watch on Nicholas. my weekend playlist. I'm so looking forward to it. And thank you for sharing it with us. And, and if you watch Nicola, who led off the conference, uh, it, it, it's such a nice juxtapositions with Andrea finishing. So thank you all. So bye bye and have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everybody. We'll close up the Zoom now until next time.